Team Jay, welcome. Uh, Team Jay will take us through the presentation. In front of you is Peter, Sharon, Alfred, Grace, and myself, Kennedy. We are, we are, we are, we are present here to, to um, present our evaluation report on KCB. Given our in-depth analysis, we recommend a buy with a 39 shilling and 15 cent uh, uh, target price, representing a 58% upside. Our buy recommendation is backed by KCB's strong regional presence and balance sheet. Its, its strategic partnership, such as that with Safaricom, for its KCB and PESA, is sustainable profitability with an average growth of 13% in profit after tax over the last four years, and, and KCB being an attractive stock over, uh, in the current bear market. KCB is the largest lender in East Africa, with 570 billion in total assets. This represents 15% of the total assets in the banking industry. Corporate banking and retail banking are its largest business segments, contributing 23 and 44% in revenues. KCB enjoys a clientele of 10.3 million customers who are serviced by 260 branches, 962 ATMs, mobile, internet, agency banking across the region. With 77% non-branch transactions, KCB's mobile banking is key to its growth, with 53% of all transactions on mobile, or on mobile banking. Over the last one year, KCB's uh, mobile banking revenues have grown 83%, and a total of 90% of the total loans are now being processed on mobile. With KCB and PESA particularly, the loans have grown 50% from 6.6 .6 billion to 9.9 .9 billion over the last one year, and in line with, the, with management's um, outlook of 20 million customers by the end of 2017, we believe the KCB and PESA will be a key driver for this, having grown 68% over the last one year to 7.8 million customers, and riding on, on its strategic partnership with Safaricom for its 22 million customers. So, how does KCB fare in the industry? Our industry overview focused on revenue contribution, GDP growth, and inflation. In terms of revenue contribution, Kenya is leading in terms of contributing to KCB at 86%, while in terms of GDP growth, Tanzania is leading at 7.2%. Well, it's important to note that Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda all have averaged at 6%, and this figure is as a result is as at the end of December uh, 2016. So this provides a good economic breeding ground for KCB to be able to enable the business expand. Now, on the flip side, however, South Sudan is a total different story. The fact that it has a negative GDP at 13.1% and a hyper inflation of 476%. This is attributed to the fact that the country has been experiencing political instability that led to the devaluation of the South Sudan currency and as a result contracting the economic performance. However, going forward with the intervention of the international community, we believe that the country is able to have a turnaround and KCB will be able to take advantage of that. Now, in terms of competitive positioning of KCB, we use the Potter's Five Forces model and based on our team estimates, competitive rivalry within the industry is very significant. This is due to the fact that Kenya, having a population of 44 million, is served by 40 banks. If you compare this with Nigeria and South Africa, these are larger economies in Africa that have fewer banks, so competition really comes out. But KCP has leveraged itself above its competitors since we knew the other day they have created their core banking system and they've used fintech proposition to advance themselves. Now on to our SWOT analysis. The key strength for KCB is a strong brand. This is due to the fact that they have a net promoter score of 51%. The weakness that comes out is the concentration risk, and this is due to the fact that Kenya is a leading contributor. On the other hand, the threat that comes out to KCB is uncertain regulatory changes, especially due to the capping of the interest rates, and we have some of the proposed legislation, such as the control of deposits. However, the good news is that there still exists a large population that are unbanked in the East African footprint, and KCB is able to streamline its operations, take advantage of that, still supporting our buy recommendation. On to our financial analysis. We use revenue and profitability, asset quality, peer comparison, and financial strength as the metrics of KCB's financial performance. Due to the interest rate capping, we expect that the net interest margin of KCB will be at its lowest between 2016 and 2017. However, going forward, we forecast a gradual increase in the net interest margins of the bank. 
The funded income has been growing, with the, with the exception of the year 2016, where we estimated a marginal decline. This is as a result of the 84% devaluation of currency in the South Sudan business. Going forward, we forecast an average of a 5% growth rate for KCB. Due to, operational, due to alternative banking channels, KCB's operational efficiency has improved. This can be witnessed by a decline in cost-to-income ratio. We forecast a cost-to-income ratio of 46% by the year 2020. KCB's core capital to total risk-weighted assets and liquidity ratios are above both the statutory minimum and the industry average. This provides a ready pool of funds by which KCB can use to grow its loan book and probably to pay more dividends. Management has set a 6% target in regards to the non-performing loans ratio of KCB. The bank is yet to achieve this number. However, when you look at the results as from the financial year 2016 half results, the asset quality of KCB is improving. In comparison to other banks in Africa, KCB is performing above average with a net income margin of 30 of 31% and a total return on assets of 3.3% as compared to the average of all of them at 29% at at and 3.2% respectively. So, how did we value KCB? Well, we valued the bank using the discounted free cash flows and relative valuation approaches and incorporated two shillings per share uh, to represent the expected dividend payout. Uh, given they had, they had just closed the financial year, but they had not announced the results. So to delve more into the discounted cash flows approach, we focused on the key value drivers of the firm and estimated the uh, free cash flows of 2017 at 11.1 .1 billion, uh, gradually rising to 17.3 billion in 2020. Discounting these at the company's cost of, of capital, we determined an equity, uh, enterprise value of 176 billion and an equity value of 140 billion, translating to 45.82 shillings uh, per share. Our key assumptions uh, were a cost of capital of 17%, and this was an awaited average between the cost of equity at 19.4% and a pre-tax cost of debt at 10%. Our risk-free rate assumption was 13%, and this was guided by uh, the current yield on a five-year government bond. Our terminal growth rate assumption of 3.7% was also awaited average of population and GDP growth rates. For the relative valuation, we employed uh, book and earnings multiples and applied the average on KCB's recent EPS and uh, book values per share to arrive at a price of 31.4 shillings. And notable uh, here also is the uh, market average EP EPS, uh, sorry, P PE ratio, which has been on a decline over the last two years and is currently approaching a five-year low, probably indicating attractive valuations in the current market situation. So we also did a sensitivity analysis and increasing the cost of capital to 21% at a lower growth rate of 0.7%, we still arrived at a target price of 34.6 shillings per share, representing a 40% upside potential. We wrapped up this section with a Monte Carlo simulation of KCB's share price and out of 20,000 simulations, we observed that 51% of the results would yield a cost of equity greater than, uh, would yield a return greater than the company's cost of equity, hence falling within our buy uh, region. Now let's look at the risks facing this business. We utilize an impact probability matrix and Camel stimulation in order to analyze our investment risks. The key risks are high NPLs, inflation, and technological <laughs> change. Inflation contributes highly to high NPLs, and KCB mitigates against this risk through scenario analysis, exposure limits, and rigorous analysis of loans dispersed through the mobile platform. With regards to technological changes, KCB FinTech is set to begin operations in June 2017 and is expected to disrupt the financial sector. The intention is to increase the number of customers using the mobile platform to 20 million, up from 7.8 million by the end of the year through a new payment system. Next, we look at the Camel's rating, and it is important to note that the rating is based on a five-point scale, with one being the best rating and five being the worst. You'll notice that KCB performs particularly well in terms of capital adequacy and management quality, and it, the high NPLs have affected asset quality, thus the rating of three. KCB has an overall Camel's rating of 1.83, indicating it is a good bank. It performs above average, although there's room for improvement. We'd also like to highlight three key post-valuation events and this are restructuring of KCB, licensing of two banks, and the release of KCB financial statements for the year 2016, which compare favorably with our 2016 estimates. In conclusion, 
based on the company analysis, fundamentals, valuation, and risk analysis, we would like to reiterate our buy recommendation with a target price of 39.15, representing a 58% upside. Thank you. I, I just wanted to find out about your valuation. You, you said you used what? I mean, I, I, I was not very clear on, on which cash flows you used on your valuation and even your use of debt. For the, for the evaluation, we used uh, two methods, the discounted cash flows and relative valuation approaches. So for the discounted cash flows, we actually used uh, the free cash flows to the firm. And then after determining the value of the firm, that's the enterprise value of 176 billion, we adjusted our debt to remain with the value of equity, which is 140 billion. So dividing this by the existing number of shares, you obtain a 45.82 shillings per share the fair value. So this was debt from this is long-term borrowings, uh, whether classified as uh, short-term or long-term. That's for accounting purposes, but it's long-term borrowing. Okay, that's debatable. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and, 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 and the multiple, multiple... Um... So for the multiples, we applied to uh, the price to book and price to earnings and having the averages and the recent book values per share and the uh, EPS of the of the So the, the price to book, how did you get that? to clarify that? The, the price to book was simply the the, the, the trading prices of the, of the various peers uh, as, uh, as of uh, it was 17th February and uh, divided by the book values per share of each uh, to get the price to book multiple. So on the first column, we have the book values per share of each. We have a price column, and then if you divide those, you get your, your price to book material. Yeah. And, and in terms of your, your valuation, you use the, the, the cost of capital or the cost of equity that you used. Um, uh, just step back there, I just want to get some questions clear. Um, so then you use cost of debt, which you said it's from your long term. And your cost of equity at about 19.4. Yes. Thank you. Debt, <laughs> yeah, what's debt for a bank uh, in your perspective? Um, Okay, I'll allow me to liken this business to uh, probably a merchandise. So because it's a bank, its inventory really is cash. So it gets deposits and lets that, lends that out. So for us, that counts as working capital. Therefore, debt would be uh, the actual long-term borrowing. So if you go to the financial statements of the, this company, there's a line on borrowings and a detailed breakdown of, of what makes up that. And for us, this, this was the debt. So, but what you'll see is that in the financial statements, the borrowing is classified, a bit of it is classified as current, and some of it as uh, long term, uh, purely for you know reporting uh, for purpose of IFRS. Yeah, but that 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 total is what makes us makes up the debt. Do deposits have a cost to them? Yes, yes. they do. And uh, you have you included that as part of your cost of debt because it's something you want. And remember, you can have deposits for less than a year. You can have a deposit <coughs> that extends beyond a year. Um, so it's not necessarily that all deposits are less than one year. Did you factor those deposits as part of your debt? Uh, not, not at all. We, again, as I've said, for a bank, if you were to compare like for like with a merchandiser, uh, the, the, the deposits from customers would be like its inventory. This is what it buys at that cost of deposit and it sells at, a, at an, interest, an, an interest, which is basically their pricing. So for us, that makes up the working capital. Okay, and then uh, cost of debt, what, what, where do you get your cost of debt from? Uh, our cost of debt, we decided to use, uh, uh, in comparison with a five-year bond, uh, the interest rate. Uh, which is 13.3. Let me clarify that, sorry. The cost of debt was an average interest, there's a, a clear column of interest payments on long-term borrowings. So you take an average of that uh, for each year, divide that by your opening value of long-term borrowings, you're able to get a percentage for each year and then get an average of that to give you the average cost of debt. 
uh, because some of these borrowings are uh, in foreign currencies, uh, but if you look at the financials, they are you know, translated. And then we felt that uh, takes care uh, of, the, of the, uh, the exchange rate impact that might be on this kind of uh, debt as well. Okay, fair enough. And then, um, why is there such a big disparity between your uh, DCF valuation and your uh, relative, uh, your relative valuation? I think in the DCF valuation is uh, focused uh, majorly on cash. Uh, in comparison to the relative valuation that is pegged on the performance of the market and uh, in terms of it's pegged on the performance of the market and uh, the book values. So we, even in terms of our weightings, we applied more weight on the DCF because we know that a, a bank as a business, the focus is more on, on the cash in terms of the loans and deposits. Yeah. Um, to add on that, we see that we are expecting the market is hitting a trap. Because of that, the market has low multiples. That's why the figure came out to be low. KCB has issued its highest dividend in the history of its banking. Uh, to me, that tells me management is not seeing much potential in terms of the market. So what do you know that they don't? In terms of uh, payout? Or yes, the dividend payout. It's the highest dividend payout. And exactly. for a bank, uh, it's a bit surprising. It's, it's a bit surprising. And that's why if you keenly analyze our valuation models, we decided to stick on DCF and relative valuation because from our end as analysts, we are not comfortable in forecasting dividends because of, number one, the uncertainty and the inconsistency that is there. And at the moment, due to the prevailing market conditions, I think the management thought it worthwhile to issue back the money back to the investors as of course things get better uh, because some analysts uh, were arguing that part of the strategy therefore could be that at the moment let's give the money to the investors and as things stabilize as macroeconomic conditions improve as regulatory changes become more certain then we'll be able now to invest and uh, expand more maybe to add thank you uh, let me just add something on that to clarify as well uh, Last, over the last year, we saw uh, KCB raise $7.5 million, sorry, $75 million yes. yeah, from IFC. This counted as tier two capital uh, as, uh, at very favorable uh, rates, you know, in the regions of 3% uh, uh, plus LIBOR. Now, comparing the company's cost of debt, look at our 10%, it, it might be that the bank thinks it's cheaper to actually go for more tier two capital because they have sufficient uh, tier one capital, uh, hence a very comfortable core capital base, and therefore they, 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 they feel it's then the right thing to do to uh, share some of these returns with the, with, with the shareholders. Uh, something else to note is that KCB's two shillings per share dividend has been there for quite a, long, quite a good number of years. Yeah? It was uh, probably only natural that they're going to increase, but as uh, Peter has mentioned, uh, we were not quite comfortable in, uh, in terms of by how much will it jump, you know, and therefore that's why we, we looked at the DDA model and chose uh, the, the free cash flows to do a better job here. Uh, a, bit, a bit more clarity on the non-operating cash. <coughs> non-operating cash of six billion sounds like a lot of dividend to me as an investor. So why are they holding so much non-operating cash? There's these statutory requirements to, to maintain a certain liquidity ratio. So because of this, uh, the company will make money, but you'll be forced to hold back some money so as to meet the minimum requirements set by the regulator, Central Bank. But in your analysis, you showed that the liquidity ratios are quite healthy. Yes, the liquidity ratios are quite healthy. We are not refusing that. But um, it does not mean, okay, the liquidity ratios are quite healthy. Yes, so, but it does not mean, it's also, okay, the liquidity ratios are quite healthy. So yes, maybe, the, but okay, the retaining, the liquidity ratios are healthy, yes. So yes, the retaining of cash could be due to the statutory minimum. But also to add on that, KCB is anticipating to grow to like international business workers. So they, they, it could also be that they're retaining money to enable them to be able to fund their investments elsewhere. But even as they're funding the investments, they need to make sure that they maintain their above statutory minimum. Um, to, to my last question is on the Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, please, as, as a very uh, layman investor, explain to me your assumptions to your Monte Carlo simulation 
Uh, I assume it was meant to give me comfort as an investor, but as well what I'd like to know is uh, what are the pitfalls of the, simul of the Monte Carlo simulation for me as an investor, uh, given the assumptions that you fit into your model? Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful question. Uh, so I'll, take, I'll just take you through the basics. Uh, for, for, for this kind of a simulation, the key input is just the standard deviation of this kind of a stock so that you have a fair understanding of what the risk in terms of volatility of prices has been uh, for, for KCB. So the standard deviation here was 1.85%. Now, having that, you need then the current level where the price is. And at this date, uh, it was trading at about 24.75 uh, shillings per share. Of course, with the dividend uh, expectation announcement incorporating into that, and we, see, we saw the market reacting to that kind of announcement. So we took a price of uh, 27.75 uh, starting point. So uh, from there, there then we ran 20,000 uh, simulations well, using a spreadsheet and uh, came up with this kind of a summary. Uh, you know, a normal distribution of the prices and looking at the, each bar represents a price range. You can see from the green one, it's, it's from uh, the price range of 21 to 29 bob. So that's where the concentration would be, that's where most of the observations were. So going that way, the, the number of observations uh, reduced, but then from that uh, price onwards, we believe if you were to buy at the prevailing market price, uh, that's before the dividend announcement, that's 24.75, you would make some, some sort of a comfortable return there. Hence, uh, now what you're saying is, given the observed previous volatility, even where the market was at that particular time, if you came into the market at that time, your chances of making a positive return on this stock is 51%, basically. So, so just to follow on that, you said the, the chances of you making a, a good return or a return on that stock is 51%. So the 51% by recommendation. Um, so why not, I mean, if, if I'm a layman investor, <clears throat> more so than my colleague. I'm looking at you with a 51% probability. Yeah. Why not recommend a hold? Uh, not forgetting, sorry if I handed you, not forgetting the, the, where the, the, the current market levels are. Uh, they are like at four year, five year uh, low levels. Uh, we've seen the trend, the trend uh, <coughs> slip. we can just keep up one, uh, one, one slide. So the last time we saw this kind of a, a traffic, well, it, could, it took uh, uh, some time to, to, to recover, and we feel that um, recovery is imminent any time from now. And so we are saying, uh, if you bought it at 24.75, well, what are the chances that it would go lower? And what are the chances? It's, it's, it's quite a chartist approach to it, but what are the chances it would go further lower? Or what are the chances that it, would, uh, it could start recovering soon uh, to correct itself towards the fair value? of 39.15 shillings uh, per share. Um, just to clarify something, uh, we're recommending a 58% upside. The 51% is the number of the number of runs that resulted in share prices that were above the current cost of equity. Okay. Um, just go back to your what is five forces. So you think uh, bargaining power of customers is high? Yeah, I think bargaining power of customers is high in the sense that the customers are the ones who put the deposit to the banks. And right now with almost innovation driving the banking sector, we saw the other day CBA launched the CBA loop. Equitel is taking shape in the market. So customers have a high bargaining power because if they go to Bank X, for example, they go to KCB, they go to Equity and say, I want these at a, I want this service, or maybe I want to deposit, one my deposits at a certain rate, and they feel that they are a bank that can give them maybe higher rates on their deposits, and uh, maybe for favorable interest on the loans they take, I think they do have a high bargaining power. That's why our bargaining power, we thought it to be significant. And as an, as an investor, an analyst, my recommendation therefore would be that uh, you take keen note still why you should buy KCB due to the fact that KCB has really uh, invested in its fintech proposition. We saw KCB right now at the moment is the only bank with a dedicated fintech department. Why? Because right now with the uh, technology, 
And right now with the capping of interest rates, banks are only banking on the fact that they're able to uh, take advantage of their non-funded income. So if you can have more customers on board, and also the concept of strategic partnerships comes in. I have M-Pesa, M-Pesa is a remote telco, they have the customers. If you can partner as a bank, and that is why KCB M-Pesa has been thriving. So if the customers are able to come on board and are able to offer you services at your convenience, then I can be able to overcome that. But at the moment, the beginning power of customers is high. So, so, I mean, it depends on, on how you look as a, <clears throat> what you consider a bank customer. So, I'm a borrower, not a lender to the bank. I mean, I'm still a lender to the bank. I'm borrowing from the bank. How is the bargaining power, how is my bargaining power high? Okay, um, just to add on what he's saying, eh? Um, you'll discover that most of the banks have um, almost similar, like the products are not so different. So because of that, as a customer, whether you're lending, whether you're borrowing, you have a very high option of what to choose from. That gives you the beginning power. Does that mean that they're not innovating enough? They're not innovative. Uh, sorry, who's not innovative? KCP? KCP. Uh, uh, I think that's what we've been emphasizing, yeah. that uh, by the mere fact that we have but then the power of customers bargaining power should be low. It's a it's a mix of both macro uh, economic issues. Uh, look at it this way: we have 41 or over 40 banks in this economy, serving 44 million people. Uh, the mere fact that people have choices, you know, you could go to KCB, you could, could go to the next person. It gives you a better bargaining power. And as uh, Sharon has explained. It's an issue of uh, bargaining power is also affected by the uh, absence or not of substitutes. In the banking sector, there's not much of differentiation. But what we're seeing now is that differentiation is slowly uh, taking shape uh, uh, with a leaning towards uh, technology. Let me just go to your SWOT. Yeah, so why do you think, I mean, if the business is innovative, uh, and using technology to grow, you know, its, it's uh, market share. Why do you think dependency on technology is a weakness? But, but we are saying that KCB is innovative, and that's why it's coming up with the whole KCB fintech. But the dependency on technology is based on the fact that um, it's being a weakness is based on the fact that cybercrime is also growing growth in technology. So you might grow your technology to a, a very high level, but you're also increasing, increasing the chances of uh, cyber attacks and all those things. And for a bank, this is a very critical aspect. So that's why we put it under weaknesses, because um, the more you grow your technology, the more you're dependent on it. And in the event that um, anything happens in terms of security issues and all those other sort of things, then uh, business will go wrong. Also to add on to that, uh, currently, or lately, in the in the banking industry market, there have been a couple of uh, staff layouts. This uh, this is actually attributable to the uh, to the dependence in technology, which which means that some of the jobs that humans can do now, technology can do it better. So with this, this means that if technology was to fail, and they have cut down on their on their staff, what is the prob the probability of it affecting the bank's operations? So that's why it is a weakness. So you have the option of leaving or taking your seats? <coughs>